when I found out that we were going to teach a clinical biomarkers module for this class, I was, I was thrilled because there are a couple subjects that show up all the time from bioinformatics within the space of biomarkers, and I wanted to make sure that we had a really good lecture to teach both of them. So this Tuesday and this Thursday are my, my only two lectures for the biomarkers module. And you'll be wrapping this whole module up next week on, uh, with another Tuesday and Thursday pairing. So I know this has been really fast, but I hope you've had as much fun as we have in producing this, uh, this clinical biomarkers class. So today, I am teaching the subject of receiver operating characteristic curves, ROC curves. And ROC might seem like a really arcane concept to teach, but it's very rare that you see a biomarker paper that doesn't have an ROC analysis somewhere within it. So I wanted to make sure that we took some time to understand what they mean, what the statistics associated with them mean. So uh, today we're going to talk about ROC curves. Now on Thursday, we'll be taking an introduction to machine learning. This is a very advanced topic, but machine learning has become so pervasive in bioinformatics, particularly in biomarker bioinformatics, that we have to talk about it. So the, these next two topics are pretty advanced ones, and as a result, I'm giving myself relatively few slides to talk about them. So along the way, we're going to talk about binary classifiers, or dichotomous classifiers, and we're going to be spending a fair amount of time talking about sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. <coughs> so, has everyone heard the term sensitivity and specificity before? I imagine that's shown up somewhere. You're going to be held accountable for knowing what that means. I'll just tell you in advance. So, um, I, I hope that you will be able to follow those slides well. All right, from there, we're going to talk about assembling a variety of tables from scores that we've generated and looking at the label information on these, uh, on these scores as well. From that, from those tables, we'll talk about how a curve connects to the data from these tables and illustrates how well a particular decision, uh, a, a particular metric lets us decide between positives and negatives. And finally, we're going to talk about setting a cut point, creating a decision rule that corresponds to an ROC curve that gives us an association of uh, a particular sensitivity and specificity. Now these are advanced topics, so as we move ahead, I want you to, to hold me up if, if I'm trying to, if I'm moving past something too quickly. All right, now let's start with what we mean by a dichotomous or binary classifier, a binary classifier. So um, you might imagine uh, that uh, somebody at recess in school who's picking, uh, picking people to be on a sports team has to do some sort of dichotomous classification. You're getting ready to play field hockey, and you're trying to figure out which people are going to be on, on your team. You're presented with the first person, and you say, yes. You're presented with the second person, and you say, no. You're presented with the third person, and you say, yes. This is a dichotomy, meaning it's separate, uh, cutting into two parts. And a binary classifier does exactly that. It cuts a selection of data points into those that are positives and those that are negatives. So, this binary classifier is going to separate the group into two classes. Most classifiers depend on some sort of scoring system, all right? So, for field hockey, you might want people who run very quickly. Is, would, would we accept that that's a good trait in field hockey? And somebody who's got some arm strength to, you know, knock the puck properly. So, I've never played field hockey in my life. I'm sorry, I'm an American. But uh, I'm imagining that I want people who are fast and who have good arms. So you might imagine that I have some way of evaluating this. Okay, this person bench presses 50 kilograms. This person can run 100 yards in this much time. I can use these as different scores and I can combine them together to create some metric to say this person is a yes and this person is a no. All right? So that's, that's what we need. We have to have some sort of score that we use for separating the good ones from the bad ones. Now, I, I imagine this person standing at the front of this, of this queue wearing the hat. That's our judge, right? And the judge is sitting at this podium and making decisions on each person that passes by in the line. This is the, our, our dichotomous classifier. And these are the subjects that we hand in. 
So everything we say today is about dichotomous classifiers. Now, I'm kind of a fan of medieval art, uh, so I was really pleased to get uh, this, this painting by Hans Memling. I grew up, uh, I grew up very, uh, in, in a, the Southern Baptist Church, and so we, we talked about Judgment Day a lot. Has everyone, everyone heard of something like Judgment Day? Yeah. Okay, so here we see that we have a judge up at the top. This is the decision rule. Down at the bottom, we have uh, Archangel, Archangel Michael holding a pair of scales, you see. And this scale is going to tell us the weight of each person's soul, perhaps. Right? So this is the metric that is being computed for each person. And we see that some people are judged to be negatives, and they are sent to perdition. And some people are judged positively, and they are sent to heaven. All right. So this is one of the, these classic examples, then, of a dichotomous classifier. So, how would you, how would you make this judgment? Uh, okay, so we're told that poor people are virtuous and rich people are not. So you could use as a metric this person's net worth at the time they die, right? So rich people, oh, they're off to perdition, and poor people, they're all straight to heaven for at last a little, a little bit of relief, right? But this has some weaknesses. There are rich people who give away a lot of money and do a lot of good in the world. And there are some poor people who do some pretty terrible things. So, you might have this mix then. You, you've got a metric, rich versus poor, but that metric is not really uh, perfect in giving you a discrimination between good people and bad people, right? So, we need to have systems that are well-tuned to separate the, the sample, the population we're working with into these two groups. Now, I want you to imagine that we have some set of patients, here I believe we have 10, A through, uh, A through J, and we have some metric that's been generated for them by our score. And we're going to say, the higher the score, the more likely it is that it's a positive, and the lower the score, the more likely it's a negative. Now, you see that we know the truth of these. These are called labels. In this case, every one of the 10 people that we're going to judge, we know the correct answer. These people are positive, these people are negative. So let's, let's make this a little more clinical in flavor. Is that okay? Let us imagine that we're talking about tuberculosis. So in the case of tuberculosis, we might go on the basis of skin tests, but skin tests are more useful in knowing exposure. Maybe we're using something like an IGRA, uh, measuring the amount of interferon gamma that person is expressing. Okay, so. If we have a high number, that person has very high expression of this uh, of the cytokine, therefore we think they're more likely to be struggling with tuberculosis. So in this case, we have actual diagnoses. Some of these people were expressing interferon gamma, but it wasn't because of the uh, it wasn't because of tuberculosis. Maybe there was some other respiratory infection that was causing it. I have a cold. Maybe I'm expressing interferon gamma. I don't know. So. We have these numbers, and now we want to evaluate how well do these numbers work when we're trying to tell people with tuberculosis apart from people who, uh, who don't have tuberculosis. Everyone sees that? That's our dichotomy here. So one of the first uh, simplest things we can do is that instead of sorting people by the order they showed up in our clinic, we can sort them by this metric, by their interferon gamma number. Okay, so now we see that our highest value was for patient D, and they had something like 0.87. That's the highest value we saw. And we see that it is associated with a label of positive. This person was, uh, was positive, and we see that the positives in general were at the top, and the negatives in general are at the bottom. Is it a perfect separation, though? It is not. And we see that right here, patient C has the fourth highest IGRA value here, but we see that patient C has a higher IGRA value even though they're, a, they're negative for tuberculosis. So this is a case where we have an error in, what, in the rule we would make based on the value we compute from it. Now I note that the, the labels and the patients and the numbers are identical between the second and third set. If you, uh, once you have the PDF of these slides, you'll be able to notice that these have all been marked green and these have all been marked red. And this line, of course, is a new addition. So, a decision rule 
is something that we need to create in addition to a metric that helps us discriminate. Our metric is this acre value, whatever, whatever this measurement is, and it, it just has this inherent property that it separates uh, positives to the top and negatives to the bottom. But we still have to assign a rule to this that says, okay, in the future, when we have someone's acre measurement, if it's above this line, they're going to be called a positive, and if it's below this line, we're going to call them a negative. So this line and the, the subsequent uh, separation into positives and negatives reflects a decision rule that's created from this metric. Does everyone see that? Uh, see that how that works? Okay, so first we needed to have some sort of metric that would allow us to rank everybody from top to bottom, and then we need a rule that lets us cut them into the, uh, the positive and negative sets. That's the goal for this analysis. All right, now, um, we have again a, a figure that is showing uh, in green these two quadrants and red, the upper right and lower left quadrants. This is a really, really common diagram, and it's the sort of thing that people love to ask questions about, specifically on the topic of biostatistics. So I, I hope everybody is able to internalize what this diagram means. We're going to try to walk through this bit by bit. If you remember one slide ago, we had a mistake. Everyone remember the mistake? We have ruled patient C is somebody who does have tuberculosis, even though they don't. Be because there's some weakness in the separation produced by this metric. So this person is an error. They've been marked as a positive, but the reality is, the truth of it, is that they're not sick with tuberculosis. This makes them a false positive, a false positive. Okay, so if we come back to this, to this chart, we see that the reality is that somebody who does have tuberculosis may be judged to have tuberculosis, in which case they are a true positive, or they may be judged to be uh, free of the disease, in which case it's a false negative. This person truly does have the disease, but they've been judged not to. So a false negative means that we failed to detect someone with tuberculosis when we were trying to do so. But that's not the only way we can make a mistake, is it? It may be that someone like the patient in the, in the previous diagram does not have tuberculosis, and yet we've judged that they do. That is a false positive. So you may incorrectly judge someone, uh, uh, you may incorrectly judge someone to be free of disease who does have disease, that's a false negative, or you may judge that someone does have a disease when they don't have that disease. That's a false positive. So false positives and false negatives represent the places you don't want to go. A really ideal biomarker is going to have all of its signal concentrated in these two quadrants. People who really do have tuberculosis really are judged to have tuberculosis. People who don't have tuberculosis really are judged not to have tuberculosis. That's where you want all of your counts to appear. And anything that appears as a false positive or a false negative represents an error in the judgment we've accomplished. Everyone good so far? Okay. I realize I'm belaboring this, but I want everyone to be really clear as we move to the next step. So we spend a lot of time in biostatistics and in the biomarker field in general um, at, at talking about sensitivity and specificity. Now, I've given the math for how we compute those down below. And uh, we'll also talk about positive predictive value and, positive, uh, sorry, and negative predictive value. Those appear at the right. And again, the math appears. But I want you to be able to put that in your own words. So when we look at the math for sensitivity, what's our denominator? True positives and false negatives. So where do those appear on this chart? Great, the left side. So the denominator for sensitivity has only to do with people who really do have tuberculosis here. Some of them have been judged to have tuberculosis, some of them have been judged not to have tuberculosis, but the reality is everybody involved in sensitivity does have tuberculosis. So when we talk about the sensitivity, we're dividing the number in this green square by everybody in this column. So to put it in, in friendly words, we would say 
Of everybody who has tuberculosis, what fraction are judged to have tuberculosis? And I'm talking about TB a lot today, but it could just as easily be cancer, or asthma, or any other disease you'd like to name. So here we see that we're asking for sensitivity, what fraction of people who, do, who are actually positive do we call positive? For specificity, do any of the people who really do have the disease count? They don't, not at all. Because specificity is all about the false positives and the true negatives. Which is to say, of all the people who are clear of this disease, what fraction do we judge to be clear of the disease? You see, that's different between these two. Here we're, we're using the top value and comparing it to the column total. Here we're using the bottom value and comparing it to the column total. Now, just as a general statement, for a, a, a clinical test, would you want sensitivity to be high and specificity to be high, or would you want sensitivity to be high and specificity to be low? Or vice versa? Or both low? Both high, both high. Anyone else want to disagree? Okay, you're right. You're right. We want sensitivity to be high, meaning if someone is sick, we want to detect that they are sick. And we want specificity to be high, meaning if someone is not sick, we want our test to say they're not sick. Everyone good with that? Okay, cool. Now, there, there's another test that we, uh, we use called accuracy. There's actually a statistical definition for accuracy as well. We're not really going to get into that. But uh, the short version is it's the sum of these two versus the sum of all four squares. <laughs> so, all right, now let's, let's move on to the rows. Okay, we've been talking about columns. The first column is sensitivity. The second column is specificity. But now we're going to talk about the first row. So this is different. Now our focus is on the people who meet a certain judgment. So the people in the top row reflect the people our test says have the disease. So of the people the test says have the disease, what fraction of them really do? That's what the positive predictive value is about. Given a positive test result, uh, is that, what is the probability that, that that person really is sick? Similarly, we can go with the negative result. On a negative result, uh, you, we would like to know what fraction of people who receive a negative result really are free of the disease. So, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Sensitivity, specificity. Everyone has, has all four of those? All right, now I'm going to talk just a moment about stigma. All right? This is a little off topic, but I think it will contextualize this result. If you went to your doctor, um, kind of nervously perhaps, and the doctor gave you a, a test for HIV, and it came back negative, how would you feel if you really were infected, but the test said you were free of this disease? That would be a pretty disastrous situation, right? I mean, you can imagine the disease really spreading in a case like that. So, it's important when we look at a clinical biomarker to be able to evaluate whether we, need to, whether we can trust the result. Sensitivity and specificity have larger social implications that we need to think about. We're going to come back to that in a bit. But for now, I want you to think a little bit about each of these tests. Um, one that I, uh, I find fascinating is the, the case of, of uh, prostate serum antigen, PSA. Has anyone heard of PSA? Okay, well, men, when you get a little older, uh, this, this subject is going to be one of some pressing <coughs> significance to you. Uh, because a lot of older men in particular find it relatively difficult to use the restroom. Because the prostate has begun growing and cramping your style, right? So, if you have a, an enlarged prostate, it could be a sign that you have prostate cancer, and that would be terrible. And for a long time, older gentlemen have been getting tested for PSA in their bloodstream. And if you've got a lot of PSA, you may have cancer, right? So this is another one of these cases where sensitivity and specificity matter. Because for some people, you have prostatitis, just meaning you've got a kind of a swollen prostate, 
and you don't have cancer, but you do have a high PSA value. So a lot of doctors will be like, maybe we should take you to surgery. Now, gentlemen, what is the number one place you would like not to have surgery ever? Exactly. Exactly. Right? So think about it. Sensitivity and specificity here look like very nice and tidy numbers. But in fact, they have huge implications for how medicine is practiced. Okay. Now that, now that all of the men are uncomfortably awake, let's continue to the next slide. All right. So we have been talking about sensitivity and specificity. Those are going to be coming right back at us uh, late, in this, late in this lecture. But for now, I want to talk about a graphical representation of these tables we've been looking at. Now, you've seen this table of numbers before, right? We've got our labels, we have our patient numbers, and we have the scores that they produce. All right. Now, back when I was a kid, when I was in seventh grade at Hall McCarter Junior High, <laughs> long time back, we used to teach people the first bits of programming in a language called Logo. Has anyone heard of Logo? Lo logo? Maybe not. You're going to learn a little Logo today. Logo is all about giving directions to a turtle. You see our turtle here? That's a turtle. All right. So, you have instructions you can give the turtle, like turn left 90 degrees, or turn right 90 degrees. You can tell him to take his tail up or his tail down, and that, that will affect whether he's leaving a line as he moves or not. And you can tell him what color you want to draw in as well. So our turtle starts right here at the origin, at zero, zero, and he's pointing due north. Everyone has that, that image in mind? All right. Now, these first three results are all labels that all have positive labels to them, correct? So that means we want to draw upward for three segments. So this, we start at the top here and basically we work our way all the way to the bottom. Every time we get a result right, we're going to go upward. Every time we have a wrong answer, we're going to jog to the side. Everyone sees that? Okay. So. Our turtle, starting here, is going to go forward 10, forward 10, forward 10. So, zoop, zoop, zoop. And each time we get one of these little red segments drawn north. When we get to this fourth result, though, we have this problem. We, are, we have now called a positive a result that was actually a negative. So we've made a mistake. So if we were to accept this as a positive, we would be making an error. As a result, we instruct our turtle to turn right 90 degrees, draw forward 10, and then again uh, turn, uh, uh, turn left to turn back north again. Then we see that there are two more segments that are correctly called. Yes, yes. So we draw, we point north one segment and then another segment. But what happens if we continue lowering our threshold and just accepting all of these as hits as well? We just keep going through the entire list in an ROC curve. And here we see that we now need to jog to the right one, two, three, four times. That's what all this forward 10, forward 10, forward 10, forward 10 business is. So what we've done is to draw an ROC curve, a receiver operating characteristic curve. It's a long name. Everyone just calls it ROC, so don't be, uh, don't be worried about that. The name actually dates back from when people were first trying to interpret signals received on radar. So an ROC plot would tell you how, how well your receiver was working in connection with a signal you were sending out. So here we see that we have four, uh, sorry, three correct judgments before our first erroneous judgment. Then we have uh, two more correct judgments and then we rack up a whole bunch of negative judgments. So this ROC is a, a visual representation of how well this metric separates the correct, uh, separates uh, uh, positives from negatives. Now, let us talk a little bit about how my little experiment with the turtle and jogging up and left, uh, up and right, differs from the way we actually do ROC. If you have the same number of uh, positives and negatives in your data set, then the ROC curve you get from the turtle would be completely square, and that would be just right. But we don't 
um, we don't use as a y-axis hits and the, and the x-axis as misses, right? Instead, we're going to use labels that are sensitivity on the y-axis and one minus specificity on the x-axis. That might seem a little strange. So it's really okay if you think of the, the y-axis as hits and the x-axis as misses, but um, in practice, the, the formal definitions for them are sensitivity and specificity. So let's think about this in terms of uh, the tables we were looking at. In, our, in, in the column data we were looking at before, how many hits were possible? There were a total of 10 people. How many of them had uh, positive labels? I'll, I'll move back. Five, yes, great, okay. So we have an even split here. We have five hits possible and five misses possible. And by the time we've uh, gone through all 10 of them, we've encountered all five of the hits and all five of the misses. That's good. All right, so it is possible that the number of hits and misses will be different from each other. So you can imagine if you had 10 misses possible in a set and only three hits in a set, the ROC curve is not going to look that interesting. You're going to have a, um, just three different uh, horizontal levels possible in the graph. So uh, when, we, uh, when we do uh, work with these, our sensitivity is going, to, uh, is going to have a number of steps north in it uh, that is equal to the number of hits in the data set and the number of stopping places on the x-axis is going to be the number of misses. This makes kind of a rectangular space, essentially. But as soon as we change this over to sensitivity and 1 minus specificity, the highest specificity value you can get is 1, and the lowest uh, sensitivity you can get is 0. And the highest value for 1 minus specificity is 1, and the lowest value for it is 0. So effectively, we're scaling uh, the y-axis and x-axis based on the number of hits and misses available in that data set. Okay, was there anything else I want to say? Yeah. So basically, by looking at this turtle plot, this is three steps up for us, but in this case, it would be 60% on the sensitivity scale. Does everyone see why that's true? There are five total hits possible in the set. We have accounted for three of them, therefore, this would be labeled 60% sensitivity. This is, one minus, uh, this is a zero on the one minus specificity scale, and this is one on the one minus specificity scale. All right. Let's move ahead. Now, one of the most common metrics that you encounter when someone has used an ROC is area under the curve. And a lot of times, people who use ROC analysis tend to assume that everybody in the audience already knows everything there is to know about uh, ROC curves. So they'll typically just say, the AUC for the separation was 0.7, or the AUC for the separation was 0.9. And a lot of times, they're going to assume that you as a listener can interpret that right out. So let's talk a little bit about what area under the curve means. Has everyone here had at least a, the first semester of calculus? A few people have, a few people haven't. OK, well, if. Uh, if this next segment makes you feel really unhappy, just pretend you're not listening. Um, in calculus, we frequently do something called integration. Does everyone remember integration? Mm -hmm. Oh, a few people do, okay. Well, integration is what we're doing with an AUC curve, uh, with an ROC curve in order to compute the area under the curve. We're asking, what is the area between zero on the, on the, the y-axis and where this curve appears. So let's start with the very best possible result that we could achieve for our classifier. Remember we had 10 people, 5 with TB, 5 without TB. So what is the best thing that we could possibly have judged by the metric? The, the metric performing in the very best possible way would give all of the positives a higher score than all of the negatives. Or, conversely, it could be flipped. 
It could mean that our metric gives a lower score to all of the positives and a higher score for all of the negatives. But what we would hope for in a really brilliant performing, um, brilliantly performing metric is a complete separation that all of the positives have scores that are all higher than all of the negatives or flipped upside down. The perfect separation is what we're going for. Now, imagine if you're the turtle drawing such a separation. You're going to go up five segments, and then you're going to jog to the right five segments. That gives you a perfect square signal. And we see that up here. You see our AUC of one? When, the, when you have a completely perfect separation between all of the positives and all of the negatives, you get an area under curve of one. That represents the best possible separation. Now, we sometimes see that the separation we achieve is terrible. So I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to separate the people in this room into those I think are likely to play field hockey and those that are not. All right, so for each person, I'm going to flip a coin. <laughs> and now I'm going to sort everyone in this room uh, based on the number of heads. If, if they're heads, then they, they're people who play field, hop, uh, field hockey, and if they're tails, they don't. How likely is my coin flip likely to be in, in assisting me to decide who here plays field hockey? It's pants. It's absolutely terrible. It's a, just the worst possible kind of classifier. So. We think that my coin flipping trick is not going to help me to isolate the, the people in this room who actually enjoy field hockey quite a lot. So, in a case like that, I have what's called a random separate. You see, sometimes I might, by chance, flip a coin, get heads, and that person actually does like field hockey. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> in that case, I have a true positive, even though my, my system for deciding who plays field hockey is trash. So we're going to get some amount of separation that's, that happens just by random chance, by, by just flipping a coin in this population. So for something like that, you're quite likely to have an area under curve that's quite close to 0.5. That's what happens when we do this kind of uh, random predictor stuff. So if you, if you think of random chance as the diagonal on here, then it should be apparent why all of these little plots have this sort of faint diagonal line going from the lower left to the upper right. That line represents random discrimination between the two groups. So if you see an AUC value of 0.5 on someone's slide and they're telling you that they have achieved discrimination between these two groups, you should really just sort of give them the back of your hand and then walk away. Because that's not, that's not the case. You have to have an AUC that's better than 0.5 and substantially better than 0.5 to have a predictor that's got any value to it. So, um, the next thing I'm going to say is, what if I were to do, uh, I were to generate some metric uh, and then test it in six people, three of whom were positive and three of whom were negative. What is the probability that by random chance I would have separated uh, the positives from the negatives perfectly in a population of six people. It could happen. It really could happen. I can even do that with my little coin trick. If I try it on enough different populations of six people, sooner or later I'm going to get perfect separation. So you can see there are ways to game the system. If you have a very small test, uh, testing group, you can come up with a very great AUC value, but it completely falls apart when you try the same trick in a population of 150 people. So, in these cases, uh, I've used a package called PROC, uh, which is a, a package made available for the R statistical environment. Um, some of you, I think, will get some exposure to the R programming language, which is very useful for doing statistics. And PROC is actually a pretty easy way, I mean, I could learn it, uh, for creating these, uh, these visualizations um, in the software itself. So, when someone says, I have an AUC of 0.937, you know that the curve should look something like this. That's, that's a discrimination rule that isn't, uh, that isn't making a lot of mistakes. It's making some, right? There, there are some people who have relatively high scores who don't actually have disease, in this case. 
but it's an awful lot better than something that gets an area under curve of <coughs> 0.728. Here, we're not doing as badly as random chance, but it's certainly not a perfect separation, not by any, in any uh, measure at all. Okay, so do we feel like we can interpret what AUC values mean? What is a perfect separation going to yield as an AUC? One. One. What is a completely by random chance separation going to yield on AUC? Great, great. Okay, on we go. Now, those curves are brilliant, but they don't make a decision rule, do they? They show what is the separation capacity of this particular metric. We still need to come up with a rule, though, to say where are we going to set the bounds. And this is where we come back to that issue of, of, of the cost, the social cost of a particular test. Now, we talked about things like screening biomarkers. Does everyone remember that discussion? Way back in the first lecture that, uh, that Dr. Beltran gave you. Okay, so in a screening test, you want to detect anyone in a population who has that disease. Now, I've given a rather extreme case. Does everyone know what Ebola virus is? Okay, Ebola virus is nasty, it is not a thing you want to have, but if you ever do get it, you probably won't have to worry about it for a long time. Because Ebola is bloody dangerous. It's just a, a terrible killer. So, if you were screening for something like Ebola virus, you would want to gather up anybody who is infected with the virus. That is a really terrible thing to have in the wild. So, detecting everyone who's got it really, really matters. So, in a case like that, Sensitivity matters above everything. After all, what is the negative outcome for somebody who doesn't have Ebola getting detected as having Ebola? What are you going to do to them? You're going to isolate them. You're going to put them by themselves in a room and pray to God they don't touch anybody else, right? And after a while, you're going to realize, hey, this person is not erupting in blisters and dying, right? So, if it, it's inconvenient to someone to sequester them in a room for a few days, but it's, it's nowhere near as bad as the downside of the, of the wrong conclusion in the opposite direction. What happens if someone does have Ebola and you don't detect that they have Ebola? They go home and they infect people, and more people end up dead. So, huge downside cost to failing to detect someone who does have the disease, relatively minor cost to erroneously detecting that someone does, uh, erroneously claiming that someone does have the disease based on the test. So for something like that, sensitivity matters. Of the people who really do have the disease, we want to capture and, and isolate all of the folks who do. And capturing a few extras is not going to kill us. Okay, now, what about another kind of biomarker? Now let's come back to our prostate serum antigen. Okay, all the guys just winced. I saw that. That's okay. It's all right. So, in that case, I want you to think about, uh, ladies, let's, let's think about our grandfathers. We care about our grandfathers? Grandfather's a good, caring person. That's, that's lovely. Okay, so, your grandfather is being tested for prostate serum antigen, and grandfather comes up with a value that is a 0.6, let's say, and the threshold for that test is 0.5, let's say. Okay, so in this case, because fa uh, grandfather has a positive on this test, are you ready to, put, uh, to strap your grandfather to the cart and send him into the surgery theater? No. No. For this, you're going to want some sort of extra confirmation, right? So in this case, <coughs> specificity is going to matter quite a lot. <coughs> we don't want to pick up a whole bunch of grandfathers and find that one in ten of those folks actually need surgery. That's kind of an awkward situation to be in. We need a better testing regimen than that. So being able to detect people, uh, to correctly classify people as not having cancer just because they have a slightly enlarged prostate is pretty necessary. Okay, but in most cases, this need for sensitivity and specificity has to exist in some sort of balance. Now, what, what can I tell you about the curve just the curve, not the, not the little x on it, in these three plots. Do those look like different curves or similar curves? They're not just similar, they're identical. Okay? 
So in these three cases, I have drawn the same curve for exactly the same separation between positives and negatives. But what I've done is to give a different cutoff in each of the three cases. In the first one, I've set the cutoff at 8.5, which gives us very, very good sensitivity, uh, but pretty lousy specificity. This is an example of a screening test cutoff. We're, we're using a, um, a value that gives us very, very good sensitivity at the loss of some specificity. And this is the trade-off that every ROC encompasses. That you can set the test to be very, very sensitive, but probably at the cost of specificity. All right, now here, I've gone in the opposite direction. I've, required, I've, I've attained a very high degree of specificity, but a relatively moderate sensitivity. So here we see that we could have gone much, much higher on the sensitivity front. So this is a model for the, the grandpa getting tested for PSA side. And finally, we have this cutoff somewhere in the middle that represents a balance of sensitivity and specificity. Every application of ROC analysis is going to have this kind of question asked of it. What is, this, the, what is the context in which this clinical biomarker will be used? What's the cost of erroneously calling someone negative or positive? What is the cost of erroneously calling a positive person negative? All right. Now, there is a mathematically rigorous way to, to go about doing this as well. Uh, Yoden's J is one example of this. So Yoden uh, was a statistician who came up with an approach to exactly balance sensitivity and specificity. He argued that we want to find the, th the threshold on this curve. It's the same curve all over again. Uh, what is the threshold we can place on this curve that gives us a, as, as strong a sensitivity as we have of specificity? And he argued that you throw, a, negative, that you throw a, a diagonal across this plot, as we generally do when making our OC plots. And now we want to look for what point on this curve has the biggest separation between that diagonal and the point on the curve. So you can see this blue arrow represents the, the value that we're maximizing in this particular plot. And we see that we can set the threshold at 9 to give us the best possible separation for for balancing sensitivity and specificity. Okay, what else do I want to say? Right, so there's, there's one other piece to this. Uh, to, to, to simply point to a location on the curve is nice, but we still have to be able to interpret that. So it is, uh, one of the things that the software, that, that packages like the PROC will do for us within the ROC uh, analysis is to actually look back into the table that produced this figure and, and tell you what this point on the curve corresponds to in terms of score. Because just looking at this plot, you can't simply read the score off of that, can you? Because we're showing things in terms of specificity, or one my specificity, and sensitivity, just to see that the curve has this little pip here does not immediately tell us what the score is. We actually have to go back to the table from which we drew this, uh, drew this rendering. Okay. So, uh, quite a few things to take away from this, but I, I think that when you see one of these plots in a paper, you'll be a whole lot better prepared to understand what they're trying to drive at. So, first off, ROC curves show us the discrimination that's achieved by some biomarker measurement. We've got some measure, uh, so, something we've measured about our patients. We want to see, does it separate the positives from the negatives? ROC is our way of getting at that answer. AUC values, which range between 0.5 and 1.0, reflect the distance achieved away from random decisions. Or if we simply flip a coin and have something that has no predictive value uh, whatsoever, it's still going to be right occasionally. So when we, when we see a value, an AUC value close to 0.5, we understand that what we're seeing is not a good discriminator at all. It has basically uh, just only a random chance of being right. An AUC value of 1, on the other hand, is, re reflects this perfect separation. You will sometimes see people using p-values uh, to, re to reflect the AUCs that they get. The p-value computed from an ROC is also taking into account the number of people who were positives and negatives and so on uh, within this collection. So when you see a p-value, uh, ju just because you have a high AUC value does not necessarily mean it's statistically significant. We have to take into account 
how many people were involved in the trial uh, for us to make that decision. Finally, selecting a threshold requires perspective on the balance of sensitivity and specificity. There's not one set answer about should we prize specificity above all else? Must we, uh, what must we care about sensitivity above all else? In almost every real world application, we must have a balance of these two.